thank you all for coming. Uh, Colonel Abrar uh, is just an amazing fellow. Uh, he comes from the, the very high mountains of Pakistan. His, his family uh, is from there near the China border. Uh, and, and, and near, yeah, near that China border, Kashmir, Pakistan uh, area where it's uh, K2 mountain and all those really big mountains are in Pakistan that are so beautiful. But uh, we met each other and, and became uh, instantly uh, uh, friends and, and worked uh, hard together. Uh, he was so dedicated to the people affected by the, uh, the Pakistan earthquake that he took early retirement from the Pakistan army and he joined the Earthquake Reconstruction and Rehabilitation Authority of Pakistan. So he uh, is responsible for leading a lot of projects, rebuilding schools, houses, and buildings, making sure that they are built to the kind of specifications that will survive another earthquake and keep people safe and alive. Plus, he's done many other things, logistics, uh, sending aid, food, water, medicines, uh, uh, and giving information to all of the partners and dealing with donors and dealing with all of the, uh, the, the many countries that have flowed uh, their aid through the Earthquake Reconstruction and Rehabilitation Authority of Pakistan, which is a, a government uh, agency that was created right after the earthquake in order to keep uh, a what was said then to be a decade-long mission. And that mission is just wrapping up this year. And uh, so without further ado, please welcome uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Colonel Abrar Ismail. He uh, described everything uh, about me, and let me uh, try to introduce Todd. Because uh, as he said that we met uh, at the Air Base Taklala. So I saw one guy because it was it was such a chaos in, in, the, in, in that area. So many aircrafts were full of uh, these cargo stuff, humanitarian uh, relief goods sent by different countries. And we have this very small airstrip in, in Pakistan, which is uh, under the control of the Army and Air Force. And I was there trying to handle this, I mean, these issues to, to take care of those aircrafts. And there I saw uh, this gentleman, you know, uh, wearing his shorts and t-shirt. And it was again... He said, where the hell this guy come? He came out of the wrong <laughs> way. <laughs> and, and the guy was running from pole to post, trying to ask people, you know, what to do and what not to do. And so in Pakistan, we have this different... Uh, uh, we can't understand, you know, if you are, you, you are, you are talking to us in, in, in your own American accent. And this guy had a pure, you know... American accent and he's trying to ask people you know what to do and what not to do and I got hold of him and I said you know calm down have water and you know I'll take care of you <laughs> so that's how, that's how you know we met each other and then he did a phenomenal job uh, I'm, I'm telling you the job he's doing as an American in, in, in my country where we have so many pressures I mean, social cultural religious I mean this guy is so bold he's so strong that he can go to all those places where even I sometimes you know take care that I should have at least two men with me to go there, you know, but he is a guy who can go there. His face is, and, and his, 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 his physique is just like those, those, those wild patans of, you know, that area, which can connect people and which can do anything. So people, you know, they are, you know, actually take care of uh, themselves because he can't, you know, he may not harm them. I've had a problem with threats in Pakistan, but I promise to stop threatening people. <laughs> you better shoot with that. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is this is Torchik, and please, uh, when he will speak, you know, you can see his work, and we are working together. I'm 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 representing my government, and I'm working for them, and he is the guy who is who is also trying to uh, solve many issues and problems which you are facing uh, related to the disaster management in Pakistan. To start with, gentlemen, as we start our things with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, it's a Quranic verse. It says. With the name of Allah, the most magnificent, the most merciful. Let me start now. Well, my sequence is going to be that I'm going to speak about the histories of uh, disasters history, national and both man-made in Pakistan. I'll also talk about the government's response and how government and the departments, they have a response towards that. Then what is the community participation in my country? Then establishment of disaster management and reconstruction authorities. And then, you know, we have done work basing on the principle of build back better. That if the buildings were better, if those facilities were better, we never had such you know big massive uh, destruction. Uh, so we have this thing that we have to go for new building codes to aware people and to prepare ourselves. Now this is a little thing which you can understand that how you know what, how we have planned this whole thing. 
prevention, which is very, very important in uh, managing disasters. I mean, first thing is that you have to go for prevention. And then is mitigation. I mean, you know that there is a problem, and it has going to start. I mean, natural disasters, normally, you know, they don't talk to you and say, and we are coming. You know, they just come and stuck. So, but we have to, uh, you know, visualize that these areas are prone to, you know, tsunamis, to earthquakes, to droughts, whatever. So, we must do certain, take certain measures to mitigate that thing. And last thing is, you know, preparedness. We must prepare ourselves that we have to run, or we have to just stick there, or we have to lie down on the ground, or do what? So this is the trend. You can see that it is, I have just taken this uh, thing from the Google and it says that from 1900 to 2012, the disaster trend is going, you know, it's in the rise. It's maybe because of the global warming, it may be because of so many things which we have done to our country, countries, areas, like cutting of trees. So the areas are prone to, you know, big, huge landslides. I mean, floods and, you know, so many other things. So we have to prepare ourselves. The global impact is that the 240 million people suffered from natural disasters and, <coughs> and most of these people, they live in under, you know, undeveloped areas like South Asia, maybe China, part of Far East. And the economic damages, they are also you know, in the rise, about 90 billion US dollars. So coming to Pakistan, the profile says that you know, we have these periodic floods in the country. Now, Pakistan, if, I'll, I'll show you the map also that we have these five major rivers uh, just you know, coming all along the, the, the area. And we have, we have this problem of floods. We have earthquakes. We have the cyclone. We also had you know, the IDP crisis, which is a very recent crisis that on both sides of Pakistan, we have, unfortunately, not a peaceful uh, countries. So whenever there is a trouble, you know, people just start pouring in into our country, and it, it multiplies the problem in, in Pakistan. And uh, the last one is a, a glacier outburst, which caused a big avalanche and affected many people. So this, these are some of the major you know, disasters Pakistan is facing. Now if you see the country, You'll find you see different. Uh, this is the map of Pakistan. So the orange uh, depicts the severe uh, uh, areas which are uh, affected by the natural disasters, and there are these two moderate and anticipated areas. So complete Pakistan is almost. And, and you know it's interesting that the, the rightmost area, which is Balochistan, that's now a hilly area, and very few people live there. So that's the most safest area. And now all these areas where you know you have these different shapes. They are the most populated areas of Pakistan. And unfortunately, they are the most affected uh, areas. So this is the impact of disasters in Pakistan, that 1,600 Pakistanis died, and probably many more, and more than 200,000 uh, were Im impacted, including you know, how many children, and because of the rivers, landslides. So, 63 million people suffered from natural disasters during the last 30 years, at an average of 2 million people per year. That's a huge number. Now, if you can see, this is a global map, and you'll see Pakistan in between. It's surrounded by Afghanistan. It's surrounded by the Central Asian state of Tajikistan. It also has its border with China, and it's a long border with India. And it also has a border with Iran, and we have sea over here. Now this is an elongated, you know, stretch, a strip, and look at the rivers, they're all coming from the north, and they're flowing to these areas. <coughs> so that's why we have these floods, we have the problem, we have these two neighbors, and because of that we have a lot of IDPs problem, and also Pakistan has its geographical importance in the area. And that's why we are always on the headline, you must have seen it in CNN, that you know this thing happened to Pakistan and that thing has happened in Pakistan. So that is why you know we are so vulnerable to those pressures also. Now again, you can see this is a globe of the same map. You'll find that this is the south. This is the Arabian Sea. Now this is the plains of Pakistan. These are the mountainous area. The Hindu Kush, you know, great uh, the 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 range. Hindu Kush, you know, comes from Central Asia and comes into Pakistan. This is all India. They are all plains and desert over here, and we have these top 
of the line five major peaks and glacier this is all this is glaciated area and because of the you know melt of that glaciers these rivers they are coming either from india or from the top of pakistan and flowing and irrigating this very portion and making it vulnerable also for floods this is just the uh, division of pakistan map you can see we have these different regions we have this disputed region of azad jammu and kashmir we call it we have a region of gilgit baltistan this is the top you know mountain where we have borders with china and afghanistan and with india we have this belt here it's called the kpk province this is the province which connects us with afghanistan and we have lot of idps now because of war against terror going on in afghanistan so we have lot many idps they are coming into pakistan and especially with the american forces and the and the the nato forces <coughs> now they have left afghanistan you must have heard that and because of that there is not peace in afghanistan and many people are again pouring into our areas then we have this balochistan which is a huge area we have balochistan has got borders with afghanistan as well as iran but we have this area is not friendly it's very hot here uh, uh, high mountains are there so very few people live on this of uh, in this in this belt so very few people living in quetta and down there in gawada <laughs> and since of course it's a very uh, it's, it's it's close to sea it has got a big uh, seaport and many people live here it's a uh, karachi is a one of the biggest cities in of pakistan why i am showing it that you know i'm going to give you the impact of of this division that how it is affecting the disaster management now you can see it's this is about the people about how many people live in pakistan how much area is there now this is very important that the annual growth is 5% and inflation is 7.8% which makes us quite vulnerable i mean the economy is very poor people can't afford to you know take care of themselves against disasters and against such things now you can see this is the division of <coughs> different areas and provinces that you have here states these are the rivers which i just mentioned and just we have jhelum we have chenab we have ravi sutlej and indus so these are the glaciers we have it's very unique that pakistan has got the biggest and and largest uh, uh, deposits of glaciers we have uh, desert we have uh, plains and also we have uh, you know all those uh, 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 kinds which which is which is which is there like we have sea so it makes us it very uh, interesting uh, place these are the lakes we have these are the mountains we have now out of 14 8000 meter high peaks in the world it's very interesting that pakistan has got five in that small area we have like the got k2 and we have got all these nanga parbat and geshur broom and got we can other mountains so these are some of the additional risk factors which we have like unplanned urban settlements because population is too much government cannot do much about it they don't have resources so people are you know growing in numbers so what is happening that unplanned urban settlement is coming up the rural housing is also very much you know into this because in in rural areas i'll show you the areas now it's very difficult to even reach here people are living there they don't have expertise for a nice construction for a good construction so they they don't apply those building codes and they are vulnerable to any kind of disasters the fragility of natural environment over grazing poverty vulnerability of communities living on mountains and dynamic pressures like cultural pressures social pressures and other factors so what pakistan did that we since we had no resources as such so after 2005 these authorities they they just emerged to settle and to try to you know uh, 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 manage the disasters so the first one was nine earthquake reconstruction authority which is my organization the national disaster management authority we are at the state level or at the central level we call it federal level then we have the provisional or the state level thing is that the regional level disaster management authorities then we have the municipal and district level authorities we have the city and town authorities which are like they are on the ground and then we have unit councils and we have community based organizations 
So this all has set up after the earthquake of 2005. Previously, we have we, we never had these authorities. Now, community response, local government response, national level response. That's how we we tickle down the 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 management of disasters. Uh, army response, response of national institutions, and then UN and international organizations response. Now these are some of the disasters of a recent past which Pakistan is facing on the right. There you can see a mosquito that's called dengue. Dengue mosquito was uh, when the, the disease started from Egypt and now it has also in Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately this mosquito uh, takes birth and then nourishes on fresh water. And there's a concept that you know when there is a stale water you will have mosquito but no. This is a fresh water, uh, water mosquito and we have to take care of it and Pakistan has been affected by this disease. We have floods and we have these oil explosions and all that. Now this is some of the pictures I would like to show. This is the flood, recent flood of 2014 in, in uh, uh, past summers. We got this floods and uh, this Punjab area which is the most populated area got affected. It's Deiraz Mahin Khan. This is Swat. You can see this, is, this was a road which is now inundated and the river. The people, you know, taking out timber from the river because it's, it's Many trees have been. These are the. Uh, you can see these are the those nomads, homeless people we have. Uh, they are uh, normally they, they take care of these uh, cattle, and they have their uh, you know those huts there, and it's all inundated, and they have come out on the road. And look at the people; they are rushing out, taking care of each other. Whatever was available, you know, because they are poor people. You know, goat maybe one of the. A means of livelihood for, for the whole family. So, you know, it's more important to take the goat or to, you know, help someone else. So that's how, you know, things move here. These are the people now, they have come to settled areas and now they are waiting for aid and for help. And they are in millions. Now this is uh, polio. Again, we have this problem. I mean, in all over the world, polio is diminished. But in Pakistan, again, it has come back. Because there is some concept in some of the areas of Pakistan that this is un-Islamic. It's unreligious. So we must not take the drops. And people have stopped giving drops to their children. And look what is the result. So there is, there are many rehabilitation centers which have been created to you know, rehabilitate that. And also, army is taking now a role to provide this uh, uh, vaccination to small kids and make sure that everybody, every children must get uh, the drops of polio. This is the dengue patient from, you know, suffering from dengue. They have been taken care of. This is the drought in the, in the Sindh part of Pakistan, where you can see this. There's no drinking water available. Women, they go in the fields, you know, walk miles to get drinking water. Uh, what to talk about, you know, using it for their bathing and other things. The drinking water is not available. This is a water well, and you can see people with their, you know, utensils waiting for water to come out, and they'll take the water. Look at the animals, you know, because of drought, gone, finished. This again, few photographs of floods. Major cities, you know, inundated. <clears throat> so more people, they are displaced. You have to put them into tents and provide them food and everything. This is this is this is a very interesting photograph. This child was born in one of the IDP camps. And uh, he is, uh, because of this uh, operation going on against war on terror in the uh, western part of Pakistan, and the operation name was Zarb-e Azab. It's an Arabic word. Zarb-e Azab was the name of the operation. So this, uh, this child was named as Zarb-e Azab. Because they said that it's because of the, the operation going on against war on terror in this region. And since the family migrated to one of the IDP camps, and the boy was born, so he was named on the name of the operation. These are more IDPs now. These are the IDPs. The three million IDPs now in certain areas. We are providing them food and rations and shelter. Look at the IDPs. They are coming out of that area because of this, you know, unpeaceful settlement. These are all IDPs getting registered and things are going on. So now I will I will focus my presentation on the earthquake because that is my department. Uh, I have been doing with it. Uh, I have been, I've been working there. We have completed many projects and I would like to give you that how this happened and what all we did.
and then we'll have answer, uh, question answer session. So it was uh, 7 uh, 26th at the rector, this, this earthquake. And it was uh, struck in the north of Pakistan. You can see the areas affected, there were total nine districts got affected. The depth of this earthquake, I mean, this whole thing was 10 kilometers, which is not very deep. So the shock waves really affected uh, most of the areas and badly. And these are those areas which were affected. And I have just given the figures. On the left, the figures are that the facilities which got destroyed because of this earthquake. And on the right is the facilities which we have reconstructed. So we are now at 66% of reconstruction. And mainly because we don't have enough money to you know, take care of these facilities. So uh, most important and vulnerable areas we have reconstructed. This you can see the uh, another map, 30,000 square kilometers is a huge area. It's equal to the size of uh, New Zealand. You know, it's, it's such a big uh, uh, territory and mostly mountainous and very tough area which got affected. This is just to, now these are those fault lines which are running all along this area. Because I told you about the mountain ranges like Karakoram and the Hindu Kush, they are not stable mountains. There, there is seismic movement going on every time. And that's why they say that K2, which is second in the world, will be, will be, will be higher than Mount Everest at one point of time. And every two years, people from the West America and other you know, ge uh, geological uh, departments, they visit that area and they measure the mountain. And they say there is a rise of a you know, few centimeters every year because of the seismic movements. So that's why we have these fault lines crisscrossing this whole region. And any you know, disturbance going on somewhere, there is a lot of impact uh, in Pakistan. So because of this earthquake, we had 3.5 million population affected. We had 73,000 people got you know, died. Severely injured were 1 lakh to 8,000 disabled. And total students, this is most unfortunate, that that was a time when, the, when, the, when, the, when students were in the school, and it was 8 o'clock in the morning. And they have just finished with their, you know, the morning assembly, you know, that's what we have there, to say a few, you know, prayers and then they go to their classes. They were just settling down in their classes that the earthquake struck and everything was finished. So, students, you know, 18,000 students. These are the number of damaged urban houses, rural houses, government buildings, roads, utilities. 200 million tons of debris had to be removed. I mean, this much, this much debris was on the ground. Now look at look at the impact of this. Is the actual photograph of that disaster, that earthquake, when it struck? You know, it's a big slide, it's a whole mountain coming down. And look at that man standing there on the road. He's also taking a photograph. He survived though, but somebody you know <laughs> captured somebody captured this. You know, it's, it's such a magnificent uh, photograph. Now look at the destruction. I was, I traveled, I think Todd was also with me on the 9th, 8th October we had this earthquake and 9th we were, you know, on the helicopter we were just going to watch out the, watch the, the, the disaster. And we, 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 we thought that every, everything is fine because we can see the rooftops are intact. But we did not realize that the walls are gone and the rooftops are flat on the, on the, on the floor. So this was happened and this is a whole town. You can see the rooftops are intact and the walls gone and people dead. Look at this destruction. Poor building codes. Yeah. Look at the roads. The mountains have gone down and the roads have been cut. Look at this. These are all urban areas, four urban settlements. Complete, you know, rubble, debris, nothing, nothing intact. Roads. Look at the destruction. The bridge. These are very famous bridges we have, the suspension bridge. And look at what, what has happened to this bridge. This used to be a hospital. The board is intact and the hospital is gone. A bridge. Yeah, so we come to relief and rescue phase. So to, as soon as this thing was stuck, you know, the local community was very enthusiastic about it. I mean, people right from all the different parts of Pakistan, they felt bad about it. And they started, you know, giving their whatever they had. So we had these camps, you know, we have made these camps and every, you can find, you know, water and medicine and everything and we don't know what all was there. 
and this is all community work which was carried out initially. And then, you know, doctors also came out, volunteers to help the people look at these injuries. You know, then the army was there. <coughs> So local community and army were the first responder in this case. And then the UN also responded. So Kufi Yanam, you know, you can see it with our ex-president Musharraf. He visited the area and he also tried and, and, and you know, tried to, you know, said that we are going to help the country because the disaster was so huge. So then you can manage, you know, down there is an American Chinook which is carrying loads of relief. And up top, an army guy is taking a mule full of loads because there are areas which where, where you can't take the, the, the vehicle. You can't take, you can't go in a car or bus or jeep. You have to be either, you know, man pack the, the relief goods or you have to take the mule. So he is, he is supplying relief. And then, you know, my department, which is the reconstruction authority, it came into being and we took over the airport and other parts. I mean, I was also working there, but then I came under the umbrella of this organization. So this is the mission of the organization to convert this adversity into an opportunity by reconstructing the lost and destroyed facilities following highest standards of rehabilitation and reconstruction with the obligation to build back better. And this is the uh, little organization, how we work. We directly come under the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Then we have our ERA Council. Then we have the ERA Board. We have ERA Headquarter. And then we have two different segments in two different affected areas. And down there we have DRAC, the last two, in yellow, DRU, which is, which is the local community. It's all local community and the notables of the area to give us suggestions, you know, what to do about, you know, their area and how we are going to reconstruct and rebuild their area. So we have taken community along in this way. So we have some hard sectors and we have some soft sectors. And in hard sectors we have housing, education, health, water sanitation. And in soft sector we have livelihood, social protection, environment. And cross-cutting themes, we have gender equality, disaster risk reduction, and environment safeguards. So this is the total mandate. We had six lakh and eleven thousand projects in total were destroyed, and we had to reconstruct that. So we started off with the temporary shelters, <coughs> just where we put them initially, the tank villages, and prefabricated shelters. And then we started building the towns slowly and gradually. Now this is that town which I showed you where the roofs were on the floor and everything was destroyed. You can see now it's all rehabilitated, people are living there, everything is intact. These are the schools which I showed you, you know, got destroyed. We have got them constructed and these are some of the housing projects. And 600,000 seismically safe houses have been constructed. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a large, it's not a, it's a small number. In that 30,000 square kilometers of area, uh, square feet of area, 600,000 houses and they're all seismically safe and people are living there and they're happy. And one of the model of a house, you know, you can see it there in the thing. This is a school, education, <coughs> hospitals. And some of the, you know, very high standard equipment and, and hospitals have been constructed. This is a very famous truck, the, the last on the right. This is a, a cargo truck we use in Pakistan and people like it because it has got so much over it, you know, painting and, and stuff like that. Make it very good to look at. And these are those bridges which I showed you, the destroyed bridge, you know, it's a suspension bridge and now it's reconstructed. The governance buildings. This is a comparison if you can see. This is a comparison. These are two photographs I have tried to mix it. This is the destroyed, and now you can see this is now reconstructed. The top is the destroyed area, and down there is a so water and sanitation. <coughs> Social protection, we also gave a lot of uh, importance and a very important thing because there were people who were landless, they had no lands. So we also tried to provide them with you know, free lands and also some money to start their livelihoods. And these are those centers which we developed in which women were, 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 were given uh, different skills to learn and then, you know, earn their own livelihoods. But it's a poor area, you know, you, there's no education, there is no nothing. I mean, it's like sitting in a, without any 
shelter or without any resource. So this is very famous artwork which we have in Pakistan on the right, on the right uh, lower side. These are those shawls these people, they, they, they hand it. And they're very, very expensive shawls. So we also try to, you know, encourage them and give them more and more. Vegetables can be grown here. So we also encourage them to grow vegetables. You know, rehabilitation centers came up to rehabilitate all those people affected from polio and also because of the earthquake. Good schools, facilities, and because of all this work, ladies and gentlemen, we got the UN Sasakawa Award uh, in 2011. Now, that's an award which is given to one, you know, organization or one nation uh, once in a year by UN. So this was what we earned uh, in 2011 because of the work. So some of the lessons learned, I've given it very briefly, that disaster management is a highly technical and sophisticated field. It is. The earthquake 2005 and Pakistan's vulnerability to other man-made and natural disasters in the recent past has highlighted the need to bring about awareness among the communities, special focus on the youth, because youth can be utilized, you know, youth can do so much. They, they are they're energetic, they, are, they, can, they can run around, they can, they can try to mobilize people and they can try to, you know, make sense. So that's what we have learned that we must mobilize youth of the area. And communities require a plat platform to work right from the outside to prevent for prevention, mitigation, and preparedness. So this is very, very important for the community, you know, because they should not wait for the country to mobilize, to, to army to come for their help, or to federal or to UN, you know, or agencies or NGOs to come and help them. But initial work has to be done by the communities themselves, and they have to be aware for uh, what they have to perform on ground. And expertise need to be analyzed, documented, <coughs> institutionalized, and then incorporated. I think these are the lessons which every, it depends upon area to area. Maybe uh, what I have said here is not applicable in Haiti or say in uh, Sierra Leone or in uh, Congo maybe. But every area has its own dynamics, its own social pressures. And that's what has to be documented. But what we have seen, what we have, what we have seen on ground, and in case there is a disaster of the same nature or maybe some other nature, so those same practices, same protocols must be, you know, followed. And then organizational structure of disaster management authorities need to be flexible and adaptable to changing environments. This is very important. Uh, normally in the government uh, offices, and I've seen it working with some other <coughs> nations, that very developed countries, you know, you have those set SOPs and you say that we can't, you know, move left or right. I mean, you've got to be flexible. You have to, you have to be so flexible that sometimes, you know, you have to take orders, you have to take decisions, no matter where you stand at that point. Because in such situations, in disaster management, you can't wait for your seniors to order you, you know, to do what? Because you have to take decision and you will save, you know, life of so many people. So, organizations must be, you know, flexible. They should give, they should, they should be centralized command, but it should be decentralized, you know, uh, work on ground. So, that is very, very important. And then community-based reconstruction and rehabilitation pays its dividends. <coughs> I have learned, I mean, this housing project, 600,000 houses, was my project. I was a project director. And I have learned that in, in Iran, when they had this bomb earthquake, which was somewhere in 2001 or two, they reconstructed houses for those pe affected people. The government made it, without taking the consent of the local of the area of bomb. And they were about 5,000 5, houses and they wanted to settle those 5,000 families into these new houses. And they refused to go and occupy those houses. They said, this is not the house we are going to live in. Why the community's consent was not taken. So community refused to go, and those houses are still there. If you go to Bam now, if you go to Iran, or ask or go Google that thing, you'll find those houses vacant. Nobody has touched those houses. So I, have, I, I, I knew this is going to be the problem. That's why what I did, I mean, when I was a program manager of this thing, that I went to the locals, and I tried to incorporate their they're, they're, you know, what they want, what they demand. And the demand was that they want to have a proper, seismically safe house because they were outside, they were in the tents. So I took the community along. And in community, in our region also, women plays a very important role. Because she is head of the house. Men may be working outside, but women controls the house, the children. So I took the ladies of the house, although it was difficult for me, because we have this thing, cultural thing that, you know, women cannot come out and meet with a stranger man. But I have to, you know, encourage them. So they came out, 
and I gave them, I gave them the responsibility that I'm going to ask you. I'm, give, I'm giving you the money. You have to distribute this money to people. And then we created uh, proper hubs, community centers, where proper teaching was given, I mean, construction uh, things. And then I came to know that there are indigenous practices which have been forgotten by people. Because this area is, uh, you know, it's a very, very old area we are living in, in Pakistan. We have this very old civilization, Indus Valley civilization. It's 6,000 years old civilization. And it's one of the top of the line civilization because very modern streets are still there. We have these uh, places like Taxila. If you go there, you will find how sophisticated those people used to live back in, you know, 6,000 years back. They had proper streets. They had proper sewage system. They had proper water system. And they used to make wine. There are those instruments we have there intact. 6,000 years old, proper distillation, you know, systems intact. So that was the sophistication of those people and their houses were seismically safe. So I tried to incorporate those practices. And this is so interesting to know. I mean, I'm sure there must be some civil engineers, you know, sitting here or students. That those people, they just, it just clicked to them. If you tell them to construct a house on a different technology, maybe on brick and mortar or, or maybe some other technology, they'll take you know, maybe 10 years to understand that how we have to construct. But those things probably work there in their genes. So I introduced three different forms of construction. One was the daji, which is made of wood. The other one was batar, which is made of wood and uh, uh, stones. And the third one was mud and, 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 and uh, wood. Because wood is available there in abundance, <laughs> mud is available there, and they did a very fantastic job. And those houses are now doing very well. This was a UN project, by the way. 2.5 billion dollars spent on this project, and the money was we we were given this money by the UN Habitat and World Bank. So they came there to to find it out that how our money has been spent. I mean, they used to come in periodically, and they were so satisfied that they gave us a very good report and then we got the award I showed you, the Sakawa Award of you know, construction. So uh, when you take community along, my point is, in such issues, in such cases, then definitely you get very good results. So this was one of the <coughs> important lessons. Now, when you look at this slide, we see that where we stand today. The blue uh, line shows that you know we have completed these projects. I mean, it's in percentage. <laughs> and the yellow one is that under construction. Why it's not completed? Because we have no money. The money we had, we have already exhausted. And to be started, on the right, you can see it in percentage, like 11%, 22%, 2%, 15%. Those are those projects which we, we also prioritize these projects, area to area. That like health, health is very important, so we must do health first. Housing is very, very important. So housing will be first, and then it comes to health, and then is education. So these were the three main sectors we have tried to complete, and these are some of the projects which we have not started or under construction. And now I can say that you know people like Todd, they they also came you know throughout this whole uh, journey of reconstruction and rehabilitation, remained with us, and tried to take the load off our shoulders because we were the government authority, we had little money. We try to help them. So people like him, you know, we also uh, have a lot of praise and we, we, we do appreciate their efforts. And especially uh, Todd, because he is now living in Pakistan, he's running this authority, he's trying to run, you know, everywhere to collect money and then he comes and he takes a project and he completes that. So, you know, that's a big job. So, ladies and gentlemen, this was it. If you have any questions, you can please ask. I'll ask one just to get everybody started off with you. Sure. One is, how long did this process of, of, of reconstruction, how long has that been, how long did it take to get the bulk of the funds? And my other question is, earthquakes are generally rare events. What kind of planning was done in advance, knowing that maybe that you were on some well, <clears throat> first I, I take the first question, uh, the, the second question, which was the planning. Um, since no planning uh, initially we had for the earthquake, I mean, we knew that earthquakes, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something which will come and 
you know, we, we also have this very strange kind of uh, mindset that everything, I mean, it's uh, very unfortunate to have, to say that everything comes from, you know, it's divine. That Allah or God is there watching us and He, he punishes us. So that's a kind of a thing which we, in, in that region, we have this understanding that whatever has happened to us, it has happened because Allah wanted or God wanted to do that to us. <coughs> so now since it is done, you know, what we can do? We can do nothing. Just try to, and that also gives us a lot of motivation, by the way, that we don't blame ourselves. We just put all the blame to Allah. That, you know, it's His, his, his thing. He has given us this trouble. He'll take care of it. So we just put everything to God. Now this is this also is a good thing because it gives us lot lot of uh, you know resilience makes us lot of resilient. On the other hand, it makes us weak because we don't take care of you know taking precautions and all those mitigation uh, measures which we which we are supposed to be doing. Uh, so your your answer is that you know we had no planning initially when this thing happened. We were just sitting relaxed and there was no building codes in the country. You know not on in the in these areas but all overall the country we had no specific building codes. And uh, yes, but now we have we have microzonation. We have microzoned the whole area. We know where which area is how much uh, prone to what kind of disaster. Uh, we have also created these community level, uh, you know, uh, organizations to actually go and take care of those disasters. If there is any, we have also made programs for the youth in the country to have enough knowledge about disasters and and, and trying to you know manage those disasters at their level. Uh, because initial responders can, you know, do a lot uh, before the main uh, help comes and take those people out. So this is the first part of your, uh, second part of your question. The first is that the mandate of ERA, this reconstruction authority was three years. We are very good in planning in Pakistan. We have got some very good economists sitting there. But they, they did a good job. But what happened, where we went wrong, that we never thought that from where we have the funds. The total cost of the reconstruction projects was 5.5 billion dollars, US dollars. We thought that in 5.5 billion US dollars, we are going to, you know, do this job and we'll just leave. But we have spent so far around 3.5 billion dollars, and then now we are we have no money. So things are moving in a very slow space, slow, slow pace, and it's now 10th, ninth year of the destruction, and still we are lacking behind. We have not completed those projects. And by the way, we are also working for the other disasters like uh, like floods and for you know drought and people you know affected from the so they're also being taken care of. So uh, yeah, we are waiting for let's see, you know, if we get some money from somewhere, maybe Pakistan government itself, you know, do good in their businesses, the economy is a little stable, so we can always uh, you know complete these this, this, this projects. Uh, could you please briefly explain the building course from the design point of view? What building course is followed in these new reconstructions? We have divided Pakistan into different regions. The most highly hazardous zone is called HH2, which is the highly hazardous zone 2. For that, we have gone for only flexible construction. Flexible means that single unit, like no double story uh, buildings, uh, either steel or wood to be used for those houses and buildings. Because we can't afford to have all those, you know, uh, top of the line engineering techniques to have, uh, you know, swinging building or what you you will find in Japan or maybe in LA because it's also prone to disasters. Uh, but what we can do is that we can mitigate and we can prepare ourselves by having that building code for zone H H two, and then for zones of H one and H, and then you know certain areas we also have some high quality, top of the line, I mean, better building codes to give a lot of strength to the buildings. So that you know they might not get collapsed so in the future. Roofs, no concrete, no where no no RCCs. Where so those high zone areas. high zone areas. It's all just like prefabricated houses. You must have seen it. A, a, a sandwich panel. It has thermo core inside it. It has got 0.5 mm uh, uh, galvanized sheet, and they have the trusses and they have the same kind of you know roof over top. So even if there is a jolt of say a 10 at the rector, you know. The buildings may go, you know, it, it will bend the, uh, the the walls and the roof, but it will not come and bang on the on the person, you know, who are inside. So that's what we have done. Yeah. <coughs> Please. Um, so, with uh, communication, 
when when the when the disaster strikes, like the immediate response, at that end, I guess the local communities come in and try to help. How how does the government communicate with them? Because I know that on a government level it takes more time. So at that point, how does the government communicate with them and how does the how do the victims communicate with them? Uh, we, uh, Pakistan has done a uh, very good job as far as the telecommunication sector is concerned. We have got these towers all over Pakistan and we have this mobile set you know, available even to a person. And by the way, if you go to Google, uh, uh, which, is, which is a country in the world having uh, more I, uh, these, these, uh, the cell phones vis-a-vis um, -vis the population, Pakistan is on the top. Every person has got either one or two phones. You know, that's something which is amazing. They might not be having food to eat, but they have a phone and they, you know, they enjoy that. <laughs> so, it's amazing. I mean, you can go Google and, and you'll, you'll find out. So, yes, that's, that's, that's how, you know, we, we communicate. Communication is no problem. And then we have created these small uh, town level or village level uh, bodies, which are, which, which, which is comprising most, mostly of the youth of the area. So, whenever there is any problem, they communicate. And, and, and you know, we have very, very, very swift way of you know, communicating and getting the, the, the answers and, and, and questions from, from those areas. So mostly it's on the individual level that they can communicate. Well, of course it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there, for about also, two years, there wasn't any cell phone communication whatsoever in the earthquake affected areas. The area of AJK is a very uh, difficult area to work in, and there's a lot of political problems. and problems between India and Pakistan, and they, they didn't really develop the communications in that area. So whatever towers were there, there was some destroyed in the earthquake, but very few cell phones even worked in that area. But after the international community came in to help rebuild after the earthquake, they actually started putting cell phone towers there. So about two years later, all the major uh, cell phone companies were working in that area. So finally, people could, could use cell phones. The other thing is that cell phones, the reason everybody has one is they're very cheap. I have a cell phone that I I could throw it against that wall literally and it would still work. I mean, it's really tough. It's a little Nokia. I got it for the equivalent of about ten U.S. dollars, and it's tough. It's not a smartphone. It's a dumb phone. But you know, most people people don't have smartphones or you know all that kind of technology. But they do have at least the cheap phone uh, for emergency or for whatever they need. And so it's a great it's a great thing to have, and it's very very inexpensive in Pakistan comparatively to here. And the calls are also very cheap. Yeah. And they have very nice packages. Like if you buy a SIM, they say, OK, 100 uh, uh, units or 500 units are free. Or about you know, <coughs> 1,000 messages are free. So these are the you know, packages they, these, these cell phone companies they offer. And uh, people love to have that. Yeah. Please. Um, I'm more interested in like the business aspect of it. Because without money, you can't really build anything. Um, so you said the earthquake happened in 2005. In okay, so it's that was the last earthquake. So it's been like a, almost a, like a decade. Nine years. So how do you have like a fundraising team that goes out and like I saw your uh, brochure and it has like a donation thing, but you yourself is one person. So do you have like a team that goes out and kind of asks for um, I don't know like pretty much the yeah. same thing, like a presentation. Yeah. All right. We have we have these two different kinds of uh, you know fundraisers. Like we, we, we carry out. One is that uh, at individual level. Like you have seen the pamphlet that is that is uh, Torche who is running this uh, uh, NGO, and he you know uh, distributes this these these pamphlets and try to you know generate funds for uh, for the projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we at the government level, we have like huge projects. Uh, very recently, I made a proposal for the remaining schools. Like we have about. Uh, 800 schools which are not yet constructed. So I made a proposal and I, I dished it out under the you know emblem of my government of Pakistan that you know we I represent my government and we need these number of schools in my country which are destroyed and I sent it to uh, the UK AID which is UK aid it's a uh, used to call it uh, DFID now they call it UK aid US AID also and some other like UNESCO and I wanted to get some you know response from there and uh, now I'm very hopeful that DFID is going to respond to that and he will take over this project. So when they take over the project, they make this agreement between the government and, I mean, DFID. Then they uh, select a focal person in my authority. It may be me, it may be anybody else. And then money is going to go to the government, not to me. It will go to my government. And then my government will say, you know, how many schools and then we have to adopt the whole procedure. Like we have very strong procedure for tendering it out and to 
taking care of that the building codes have been implemented and the project is completed in you know well in time. So I do it that level. He does it, you know, in this level where he can get it for, you know, like his project maybe a hospital or maybe for a school. But the project which he has selected is also one of our projects. We are we are talking about huge projects like 800 schools. I mean, he can't do it 800 schools. So he may take it two schools or three schools. Whatever his, you know, he, he feels that you know he has money, so he will take over those two and will complete them. So that's how you know we work. Everyone wants to pitch in, and there are hundreds of NGOs and NGOs who want to work uh, in that area. So it results in unsolicited support, a lot of unsolicited, unsolicited support. So has there been any effort to make a system as such to channelize that support to those proper areas? And uh, you're talking about the early phase of the disaster, when there is a disaster and people would like to go for a rescue or provide relief. Now everybody is so enthusiastic that you would like to go and take out, you know, uh, uh, a person who is injured, or you would like to go and give food and water to a family which has got no shelter over it, and you know they are thirsty. You're right. This is what happened, and this is one of the lessons learned we had, because the roads in the mountains you don't have those big four, uh, you know, uh, motorways, or you have, don't have those interstate uh, roads like you have here, like five lanes or ten lanes or eight lane lanes. We have this just one single road uh, connecting two areas with each other. And what happened was that the trucks and the buses were so much because people, everybody wanted to go and meet the, you know, the, the environment there. And everything was, you know, it was choked, the roads were blocked. Uh, this is the time. But now we have a system in which we have proper uh, guiding arrangement. We also have made those centers where every individual who has everything, anything can come and can put his, uh, uh, whatever he wants to, you know, help these people, like you have water, medicine or food stuff if he has. Then also we need, if, if you are a volunteer, we would like to, you know, categorize you that what kind of work you can perform. Do we need you there or no? Not now, you know, we need you here, where you can manage one of the warehouse. So we have adopted this system now, and uh, it's, it's, it's in place. And that's why the Disaster Management Authority, the NDMA, was created to, to do this initial, take care of these, these issues. So we have a proper system in place now. Yes, sir. Please. Following up on that question, what are you doing to uh, bridge the trust issue the people have with the government? Like, a lot of people go there because they don't feel that the government will be utilized all the time, and they will go there themselves, like, I have done that too. So, so what are you doing to bridge the hype? You know, uh, uh, trust is not something which is, which is, which is going to be uh, built in a, in a click of a second. It, it needs time. It needs time. Um, yes, you also uh, must know that people have a lot of belief in the army in Pakistan. They feel that if we give money to a civil government or a civil servant who is working there as, as an administrator, he might eat that money. But if we give the same money or same product or same material to the army, we are sure that it is going, going to go to a right place. Am I, am I, am I right or not? So, so, so what we have done is that we have taken army as as a first responder. Although it has been criticized by many disaster managers when we go and discuss this issue that army must not take part in these issues. But yes, uh, places where you have, I mean, these kind of things, then you know you have to give it to a people or to an organization which has uh, some morals and some ethics. So uh, in our country, yes, we have this uh, problem. You have rightly brought it out. So we have given this issue, this whole thing to the army. Because army deals with it, and they have done it, and people have got a lot of trust uh, in the army. Yeah, and no, no one organization uh, in any of these disasters. I mean, if you look at Hurricane Katrina, if you look at even even a smaller disaster, it was a horrible disaster, but operationally speaking, it was in a smaller area, 9-11. Uh, when you look at any disaster, whether it's Japan or Sri Lanka, the tsunami, some tsunamis, or the earthquake in Haiti, Every of these disasters are too big for even one government really to handle. 
you need small organizations, individuals, large organizations, medium-sized organizations, and in the best scenario, they would be all well-coordinated. But it's a disaster. So being a disaster, sometimes coordination, sometimes people don't want to coordinate. Sometimes it's very difficult to get them to coordinate. Sometimes communications are down. So if somebody wants to help and they can come themselves with resources and help deliver the things themselves, they should do that if they can, if they're able to. Uh, but uh, if anyone just relies on the army or just relies on any one entity um, or just relies on the UN, then they're making a big mistake because the small and mid-level organizations that have a, a, a proven track record often fill the gaps in the system. And if it's just one large entity or a couple large entities, I've seen it happen so many times where gaps in the system are created and people don't, uh, certain people in certain places don't get everything. So when people have the impression that the UN system can, can handle it all, well, they're, it, it's a totally, total fallacy. And I've seen it in every disaster uh, play out where so many organizations are needed to actually get the job done. And they should all be, in a perfect world, coordinating together. And I know my organization does that. We coordinate a lot with the Army. And they're, they're a central force, so you should coordinate with them. And in, in, in some cases, collaborate. But uh, at the same time, you have some organizations that prefer not to collaborate for whatever reason. Not that they're dishonest, but maybe they just don't trust anyone else. So you just get all kinds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just thank you. Can you step out, have 12 o'clock class, or whatever we understand? So. Yeah, if anyone has to go and has class. Uh, Stay if you can. Yeah. yeah, and you can uh, take a flyer and get in touch with me. And uh, if you want to get in touch with Colonel O'Brien, you can either get in touch, get his number from him, or, or get in touch with him through me. And I'd be happy to, uh, to make sure you get hooked up with him. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So my talk will be a little bit different. Uh, kind of what, what I would like to let everybody know uh, is that anybody who wants to go into this field uh, can do it. Every person can make a difference. <laughs> And you really don't need to have every skill uh, and, and be even uh, educated in disaster relief to be good at disaster response. And my life is kind of uh, evidence of that. Um, I, uh, I guess that my life has been a disaster. So <laughs> in that regard, you could say that I've had experience. Uh, I lost my mom when I was 12. I got into drugs. As a teenager, I was uh, very much... Uh, uh, a troublemaker and uh, thank God music saved my life and saved me from drugs and I went down the, uh, the path of music as you can see in these photos I was a rock musician and this is what I did with my life I was signed by Sid Bernstein who brought the Beatles and the Stones to America and he recently passed away about a year ago wonderful wonderful human being uh, worked with Judy Garland and Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett Jethro Tull Marilyn Monroe you name it but he's famous, most famous for bringing the Beatles to America. And uh, he liked my music. He signed me. And uh, he had set up a, uh, a showcase at CBGB's nightclub in New York. And I had been playing in clubs around town for a couple of years and, and got noticed by him and his team. So they signed me. And on September 12th of 2001, I was supposed to do a concert at CBGB's, a world-famous nightclub, uh, where he had set up with uh, several... Uh, people that were in the uh, record business. The day before that, I was in the uh, hotel and I looked out my window and uh, saw that the towers were on fire. And that didn't look right, obviously. Uh, so from my hotel window, I watched them burn and fall and I thought, I have to do something. So I forgot all about music. Uh, I grabbed my van, uh, which was a big conversion van that I had all my amplifiers and guitars in. I unloaded it. I went down to Chelsea Piers where I found out there was a uh, disaster response center being set up. I went there and I asked them if they needed any help 
And uh, they said, well, uh, you know, we, we're just kind of, everything's kind of crazy. But I heard a lady in the background <laughs> say to somebody else that they needed to transport some fruit and Gatorade down to a fire captain whose team was getting dehydrated right at the scene of the destruction. So I went over to her and I said, I have a van. And in about 10 minutes, I had three US Marines, myself, and they were loading up my van with stuff. And we went down to ground zero. And that started uh, my disaster response career. I had no aptitude for it that I knew of. I was a musician trying to get a record deal. And I wasn't really ever even thinking I could respond to a disaster. As it turned out, and as I realized later as the days went on in, in, at Ground Zero, I realized that the, some of the things I'd done in the music business, you know, dealing with radio announcers and uh, you trying to get your record play, getting paid by the guy who owns the club at the end of the night, setting up your own equipment, recording, calling everybody, fixing your own van when you break down in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa, and you either fix your van or it's going to stay there. So you learn logistics when you're a musician working and traveling around, and so you have to be a jack of all trades, and I think that may have prepared me also. So I was at Ground Zero for about uh, five days until I realized I wasn't needed anymore. Firefighters and rescuers were coming by where we had set up a supply station. We were giving medicine and food and water. We were taking down information from the firefighters and policemen and anyone else that was working down there to see what they needed. And I just kind of realized that I kind of had a natural ability for logistics and also to operate in a very heartbreaking and very difficult, uh, uh, challenging logistical environment. And so that kind of opened up my eyes to a, another way of living and, and uh, serving people. And the other thing that happened is I really lost my desire for a commercial mu music career at 9-11. I saw that the world was in much worse shape than I thought. There was a lot of suffering people. And I realized I was good at this, and I just lost that desire to, in this world at least, get fame and fortune. Uh, in a world where so many children are suffering, it just, after what I experienced in 9-11, felt very selfish and very self-serving to just want to be famous and get a record deal and a gold record and play in front of thousands of people. Um, I did get a chance to do all those things, but um, with doing disaster response, uh, I really... Uh, it really opened my eyes up and gave me a way to, to express myself as an artist, as a musician, as a human being, and to try to help heal people that are in, in disaster. So this is me giving some, so right at the, uh, the towers where they fell, some uh, uh, fire company was getting some rest after being in for 12 hours. So the appreciation that they showed uh, for somebody that cared enough to bring them some medicines, whatever they needed, that they could put in their pockets for their next trip inside the pile of rubble, uh, energy bars, even the simple things. So what I learned in disaster response is not just logistics, but compassion and caring about those who are suffering. And you don't really need, if you have that in you, then you don't need training for that. You might need training on how to do it better, how to respond better and get those things, but the, uh, a lot of times when you meet people that are either working and seeing heartbreaking things, responders themselves, or the people who have been affected directly in a disaster, giving them love and compassion is almost just as healing and just as important as whatever you're bringing them. And it's, it, I can't, uh, it can't uh, underestimate the, the, the power of that. Uh, I don't have many photos of Sri Lanka, but I later went to Sri Lanka this was at a, an orphanage where I was playing music for children. And uh, after 9-11, when the, when the tsunami happened, I thought, what I learned at 9-11, why just sit here and in front of the television and watch what's going on? I'll go and do something about it. So I got contacted a group of, um, of, uh, of that was going there. Uh, they were called Global Crossroads. And they were doing a mission. And I applied for them. And I told them about my work at Ground Zero. Because of that, they took me, and I got more experience and worked there. Then, the, just the, about a month after getting back from, from that disaster, uh, was the uh, Hurricane Katrina. So this is me down at, uh, I, I went uh, down with a group uh, that was uh, doing search and rescue and bringing uh, Zodiac boats down to the US Army 82nd Airborne here. At, this was Algiers Naval Station right across the Mississippi from downtown in the French Quarter. And these are some photos I took. We were out with the Army 
Um, this is my partner, Jim. He's an ex-Marine who's gone to every disaster with me in the emergency phase. And we were patching people up and rescuing people. Uh, this little girl was very happy to be rescued from her home. Um, and uh, so this is the scene in New Orleans that we saw. Uh, these are two German shepherds. I think it was three German shepherds who rescued at this house and uh, saved a man. Um, so they did a lot of animal rescue. And then when the waters went down, uh, Jim and I started bringing in an, a, a rabies vaccine for humans and animals uh, that were trapped. A lot, of, uh, there were, a lot of animals were trapped in New Orleans because people didn't know. They thought they'll leave for a couple days and come back. Then they couldn't come back in. So they left Fido or Precious with enough food for three days thinking they'll be fine. And then the city's flooded. They can't get back in. So we started getting calls from the Louisiana Department of Animal Control asking, would we go and break into houses? I love to break stuff. So I actually got to smash the windows and I got to get my, uh, my sledgehammer and uh, all kinds of stuff and break windows and go into houses and rescue dogs and cats who uh, every now and then they would jump into your lap like, oh, thank you for rescuing me. But most of the time they were scared to death and thought that we were going to hurt them. So we had to almost like be dog catchers. This was... Um, So this was uh, the USS Tortuga ship where the, the Navy personnel were helping us set up a shelter for animals. We called it Camp Milo and Otis, and we were bringing animals there. Then we were delivering a rabies vaccine everywhere. We even delivered pizzas to the Army. So whatever we could do with our truck, and of course uh, these Army uh, people that were, uh, hadn't seen a, a Big Mac or a piece of pizza for a, a month, you can imagine delivering them a a pizza was pretty nice. So this was the inside of a lot of the houses. You can see the cat prints there. And we'd have to find these cats and dogs who were often hiding and scared to death. And it was amazing what cats can, they really do have nine lives. Because we saw, we saw houses where the water was completely up to the ceiling. And, and we were like, okay, there's no way there's a live cat in this locked house. You know, somebody called frantic, please save Precious. You know, we think she's, you know, in the house somewhere and, you know, we hope she's alive. And we'd go in there and we'd see the water line had gone all the way to the roof. And we thought, okay, we'll find a dead cat and we'll have to report that. And we would find live cats. I don't know what they did or how they, I, I don't know, I have no idea. I still don't know. But it was like this, you know, the place was a mess. And so we were out there and this was New Orleans and we would get addresses and, you know, and people would like beg us to break into their house to find their dog or cat. So you can see the mold growing up the you know, you see where the water line was in some of these houses. And uh, so this was me calling a person because we'd actually get the addresses. We'd go to the location, and if we found a live animal, which was actually most of the time, we would call that person and let them know. And this was me actually calling a person and letting them know that their dog is very skinny and hasn't eaten for a while, but he's alive and we're feeding him now. So, you, you know, the feeling that you got from people that you were saving their pet's life because people often think of their dog or cat as their family member. They're, they're, sometimes they love them like even more than their own children. So uh, this was uh, some Rottweiler puppies that we saved with the mom. And when we approached the mom, she was this big, mean-looking Rottweiler. And we thought she was going to take our heads off, but she was so sweet. And uh, we were able to save her puppies who were really starving. We would check them in at Lamar Dixon, do their paperwork, get them tagged. And uh, then after about five weeks in, in New Orleans, I went home, took the truck back that the Maryland Department of Emergency, Emergency Management had uh, paid for from, from budget, uh, rent a truck. And uh, then literally the day I got back from Hurricane Katrina it was October 8th, the day of the earthquake. I came in my house, I gave my son a hug, we sat down to a pizza, turned on the television, earthquake in Pakistan. So I was still in disaster response mode. I looked at my son and I said, I'm going to Pakistan. Before I knew how I was going to get there, who I was going to go with, or anything. So I'm impulsive that way. I live my life that way. I make decisions. My life is like a feather in the wind. So I can cancel my gigs because I'm a musician. So I can just go when I want to go. So I decided I was going to go. Then I, some people, they figure out if they can do it before deciding if they're going to do it. I am a little crazy like that. I decide I'm going to do something, and then I figure out how I'm going to do it. So I decided I'm going to Pakistan, and I Googled the Pakistan Embassy, and they said there's a team of doctors that we know about. So I joined that team of doctors after calling them. 
They, did, they didn't have a logistics person, they were just a bunch of doctors. So a bunch of doctors going into a disaster zone in a remote area that's affected and you don't have water or food or electricity and everything's a mess and people are uh, you know, desperate for resources, that's not a good idea to go into a disaster zone without a logistics person because doctors are really good at being doctors. But they're, uh, if they have to worry about procuring all their medicines, getting their helicopters, their communication, their fuel, their generators, uh, their resupply, their liaison with other organization, their operational intel, their, uh, you know, everything that they need. If they have to be worried about that, then they don't have any time to be doctors. So my job as a logistics person is to make sure that they have time, all the time in the world, to just worry about healing people and, and being doctors. And then I will take care of their sleeping bags and their tents and dig their bathrooms and get their electricity wired and get their fresh bread from the army next door. Or go and meet the other organizations that are around and see how we can work together and share. So they, they can stay in the tent and treat patients. So this was Pakistan and you can see this was what Colonel O'Brien was talking about earlier, how the roofs were intact but just totally destroyed. Uh, this was a, when I first got off the helicopter, one of the first uh, disaster victims I met, a little girl who had broken both of her arms, and this was the kind of injuries that we'd see. So we were unpacking and packing medicine and getting things organized all the time, running around. The doctors were treating patients. You can see the Pakistan Army is unloading uh, the uh, cargo from the U.S. Chinook helicopters, which were life-saving in this mission because they have such a, they have the largest, uh, the U.S. Cavalry has the largest load capacity of any uh, force in the world. They can move more men, equipment, machines than anyone else. So in this particular case, it worked out really well for the people. We were able to get injured people who were, you know, would be dying or losing their limbs very quickly. It was a 45-minute uh, uh, helicopter ride to Islamabad. And then I would go back and re resupply. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Colonel Brar knows Major General Javed very well with uh, Pakistan Aviation. So we worked with him. This is a U.S. Army colonel that was a liaison for the Defense Department who was working there. And this is one of the largest cargo airplanes ever. It's a Russian plane. Uh, and this was what Colonel Brar was dealing with, all this mess. So when I first met him, I was like, this is chaos here. Where do I find where you guys have dropped the medicines? So he let me know where they were organizing things. So we got, we would get medicines and I'd go back and forth. We'd get formula for little babies and, uh, and so young mothers could feed their babies because literally there was nothing without the helicopters. Roads were sheared off of mountains and it's the first time I've ever seen whole mountains cracked in half. I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw a mountain cracked in half. I, that something I never thought I'd see. So uh, we worked with the local politician, or the national politicians, local politicians, uh, anybody that uh, that we could get resources from, and uh, I stayed, I was going to stay for two weeks, and after two weeks I saw, you know, this is an incredibly large disaster, the doctors said they were going to start sending more teams of doctors and they wanted me to stay, so I stayed. And uh, after about two months of flying in the helicopters and working in the emergency phase, I decided that this was a great place to serve humanity, there was a lot of wonderful children and beautiful people that I'd met, and I decided to stay in these mountains and keep serving people. And, uh, and I'm still there. Uh, you know, whether it's meeting the people on the ground, uh, playing music for the kids in the schools. This is my son, who's also worked with me in several disasters now, uh, including uh, just recently in, in the Philippines and in Pakistan. Uh, this is me where, when I wear the shelver kameez uh, in SWAT. And uh, there's a lot of guys that look like me up there. So, or I look like them. As long as I don't open my mouth, because I can't speak Pashto, but um, I, I kind of do blend in a little bit. This is when I got a medal from uh, President Musharraf at the time for my work in the earthquake. And uh, this is with Colonel Lebrard. That's Colonel Lebrard there. And we were in Balakot uh, talking to the community about some of their construction needs. So I've stayed in Pakistan and uh, uh, there's been a lot of disaster since then. Just this last five, five months, it's been uh, five of the most intense months I've ever uh, been involved in because we're doing two large disaster response missions simultaneously. There is one million people who have left North Waziristan because of fighting between the Pakistan army and the Taliban. The Pakistan army has come in there, they're kicking the crap out of the Taliban, but all the people have to leave, and there's a million people that are living in neighboring districts. My team was asked by a politician named Imran Khan, to, uh, he's a famous cricketer and politician in Pakistan that some of you might know, know, might know about, 
Um, he is funding our operations in a big way because uh, he cares about those people and wants to do something for them. So we're managing all their health care. We've taken over a couple of medical facilities, making sure they have medicines, making sure, because when you have a million population in a, in a district and then you dump another million on top of them, now you've got two million affected. The people that live there are also affected. Their medical facilities, their food, their resources, everything becomes overwhelmed. So we're in there making sure that the overwhelmed healthcare system gets a break. And then with the floods this summer that have affected millions, we're also working in Punjab in these areas where uh, Colonel Brower was describing many rivers and, uh, and there's a lot, been a lot of floods. We think that because of four major floods in the last five years, we think that it has something to do with climate change because it's been a different weather pattern in the last five years in Pakistan with these monsoons. So, um, so I've stayed there. Uh, also, during my time in Pakistan in the last nine years, I've deployed significant missions. This is uh, with the 82nd Airborne in Haiti. Uh, we, we worked with them. Uh, so we took over a, a destroyed children's amusement park and uh, started a hospital there, brought doctors in. We were very fortunate that the Pakistan Army had a UN peacekeeping brigade uh, that uh, guys that I knew, and they also helped us out with uh, security and operations. Uh, they were one of six countries that, during the time of the earthquake, were deployed in Haiti for peacekeeping. And of course, now they did uh, relief work. So this is me with their commander uh, doing coordination. This is a Jordanian uh, army. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different military there that were helping in Haiti. This is USAID. So we did a lot of coordination meetings. Um, this is some of my team of volunteer doctors having a meeting at night in the, in the, where we had our uh, camped in our tents. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Judy Sandick from Maine who came and has worked with me in Pakistan as well. And uh, took you know, great doctors that, you know, deliver babies and, you know, manage the, they, not just earthquake injuries, not just people with their broken bones from the earthquake, but when all the hospitals are destroyed, if you have a headache or if you have a baby that you want, you know, that you need to have, you know, you don't have a medical facility. So we're dealing with all of the aches and pains of the community, uh, not just the, the, when the bone's sticking out because of a, or a lost limb. We're, we're dealing with everything. So we take care of whatever's needed. And then I like water, so I always find a body of water wherever I'm at. I've jumped into Mangla Dam. Everybody thinks I'm nuts. But it's a great way to cool off. It's hot in these areas, and I prefer the cold. Uh, that's why I don't have a jacket, because I love the cold. So, uh, but on this particular occasion, uh, I was out there floating in the lake. It was at the border of Dominican Republic and Haiti. And uh, I heard, I saw everybody, I thought they were waving to me. They were actually going, because there's crocodiles in that water. And I didn't know. <laughs> then I found out, I said, you guys are kidding. It's baloney. I've never heard of crocodiles in Haiti. And, and so then I looked it up. And that saltwater lake happens to be the only place in Dominican Republic where there are crocodiles. So <laughs> I was lucky that I didn't become a snack. Um, but, Basically, I have a superhuman power, and the one, I, the one superhuman power that I have that gets me through these disaster zones is I can sleep anywhere, anytime, for five minutes, for two hours, whatever it is, and be fine. And I, this is, people are fascinated with me doing this, uh, so they always take pictures of me, because I can sleep anywhere and be rejuvenated very quickly, so <laughs> this, is, this is kind of what I do. And, uh, I know it's kind of funny, but the reason I say this is because it really, if you can get rest and you can be de-stressed and get rejuvenated and sleep anywhere and be, be totally out. I've even slept through large aftershocks of earthquakes where everybody else was freaking out. And I woke up the next morning and they said, oh, did you feel that? And I, no, actually. So because of that, I guess I'm able to get rest and, and rejuvenate. And if you can get rested and rejuvenate, then you're less stressful. You're able to think clearly and operate and do work because it is a stressful environment. And many people that come don't realize just how stressful it is, and then it gets to them. So, and, and sometimes it's because they can't rest. They can't sleep in all the noise. They can't sleep with all the activity. They're too excited. They're too much to do, whatever it is. And because they don't get rest, they get sick or they, they get, uh, uh, you know, their immune system goes down, or they get stressed out. So <coughs> this is in Japan, and you can see what a wreck that place was. It was Ishinomaki in northern Japan, and, uh, you know, boats in the streets. I was finding fish and sharks and octopus three miles inland in people's houses, and we were funding a uh, group of um, Japanese students to help dig out all the deb debris from houses that survived. Because the first third, third of the city was totally destroyed, wiped out, 
and deposited onto the second third of the city, and then the third third was okay. So people were living in hospitals and schools in, 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 the, in the parts that were of the city that were not affected. About six hours north of Tokyo, and a couple hours north of Fukushima. This was a radiation badge that we had to wear, because they were worried about radiation. And uh, when they sent mine back for testing, they said it, the Geiger counter just went nuts when, when they checked it. So I think I got a little bit of radiation. But as much coke and acid as I did when I was a teenager, I doubt that it affected me much. So, I mean, I'm just being honest. So this is some of the, uh, uh, the teams that we worked with. Wonderful people. This is a, a group of firefighters and paramedics from uh, Seattle, Washington, that uh, we deployed with in Japan. And so we helped deliver food. And then I put together this gentleman uh, who has a fuel relief fund. So he gives fuel out in disasters. And we've hooked up in the last couple disasters uh, in Haiti and Japan and, uh, and the Philippines. And what he does is he sets up with the government, buys fuel, and gives it to people for heating, for kerosene, for running their generators. And it's one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen. So I've helped him set up, because he was spinning his wheels in Tokyo. One of the things that if anyone here ever does disaster response and goes to a country, just avoid the federal government of that country. Because they're sitting in their ivory towers they're not affected, they're, they're going to go home and live in their mansions, and they're not in a hurry to do anything, and everything has to be dotted the I and crossed the T, and it really is not the way disaster response should be done. So what you do is you circumnavigate that, and Ted was spinning his wheels in, in, uh, in Tokyo, so he said, come to Ishinomaki with me, I'll, I'll introduce you to the mayor, I have an interpreter, I'll introduce you to the local people that are in the prefectures and the senators that are there, and they are directly affected, and their people who they answer to are direct. So those are the people you can deal with. Federal government, just stay away from them uh, in most cases. Uh, even, in, even in Japan, it was, a, it was quite a mess. Um, this was uh, this group of, of uh, young uh, students from Japan that we were funding, cleaning up people's homes. And then, of course, I'm a musician, so uh, there was a bunch of people living in shelters in a school, and they looked kind of glum one day. We were delivering some food. And I always bring my guitar wherever I go. So I asked if they might want music, and they really wanted it. And people that couldn't understand me were singing English lyrics to English uh, rock songs. So I guess the Japanese really love American music because that way, you know, they knew, you know, whether I was playing an Aerosmith song or or uh, John Denver, they seemed to know the words. Uh, this was a. Uh, uh, a memorial that we did, you know, one thing is always respect the local culture, the local religion, the local people, and those that have died uh, come to it with great reverence. This is also in the uh, Philippines where we helped unlock the logistics. It's all islands and a lot of shipping was clogged and a lot of shipping containers were sitting. So we helped unlock a lot of the, uh, this uh, logistics nightmare where, uh, where the ferries and the uh, the, 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 the system of uh, shipping was, was really behind schedule and locked up because everybody needs everything right away. So the shipping is just crazy, especially when the whole area that's hit is nothing but large and small islands. So we worked there with the, uh, with the U.S. Marine Corps and the Ospreys. This is right we were just we were refueling, so we had a moment to take a photo with these guys. But these Ospreys are amazing to fly in. I mean, they're just incredible. And uh, so the Marines did a lot. And, uh, and brought a lot of stuff in and, and took us uh, island hopping. Wherever we needed to go, they would, they would take us where we needed to go. And we, uh, this is just one of the distributions that we've done. And of course, distributions have to be very highly organized, highly documented, so that you know that each family in that village, you can prove to the donors that they got stuff and they hear, they hear it. So these are some of the photos. We have hundreds of these, of the same photo of different families because we're documenting, documenting what they got, uh, food, water, and uh, clothes and all the things that they had lost uh, and things that they needed to survive. And uh, this is uh, my son here who was on that mission with me. You can see it was quite sweaty and hot there. You can see he was pretty hot. But uh, so uh, we were able to bring things to people that had not gotten anything yet because one of the things about the Philippines is there's so many remote places that were hit in such a widespread area that uh, there were literally many villages even two weeks later that hadn't seen the first help. So uh, we were able to get into some of these places and, uh, and do some good work. And uh, oh, this is my, my wardrobe. 
um, in disaster response, that's kind of my uniform. I know some people like to wear the, you know, the official looking uniform and maybe look kind of military and have all the gear, but I don't really need gear. That's for somebody else doing some other job. Disaster response has many facets. As a logistics coordinator and manager, I need a phone, a satellite phone if there isn't phones, I need a phone network, I need this pad and paper, and myself. And I need to talk to everybody I can from the moment that I know I'm going to the disaster zone, Google the country, talk to people on the plane, meet everybody I can, find out who they are, what they're doing, get their numbers, because what ends up happening every time is two weeks later, somebody that I got their number who I thought I'll never see this guy again or need him, but I did take that note. I find out, oh, this person needs a guy that is doing this, or this person needs this person. I put people together, so you make people uh, a good logistics manager and a disaster response coordinator will take notes of everything, note down everything, keep it cataloged in their little book, put it in their computer, and then make sure that they keep going over their notes every day and every night when they get a moment and connect people that you know, oh, this person needs to meet this person. And some of the best work I've done that has resulted in thousands of people being helped was just because I did nothing more than connect the court to people that would have never met or to organizations that would have never met. So uh, I'm also a musician, so whenever I have time after the emergency phase, I have, uh, we have a great time playing music. I've learned a lot of Pakistani music. And uh, you, know, you can see by this picture that the idea in America is somehow that music is forbidden in Islam and they don't allow music and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's horse manure. Because you go anywhere you go in Pakistan, they just love you know, seeing Agora, a white guy, singing in their language. Um, so this is some of the beautiful children that we've served. And I've played music. I've had the honor of playing with a lot of Pakistani's biggest stars, Pakistan's biggest stars and um, rock stars. And then also take care of the animals. I always help the animals too. If you're in a society, especially like Pakistan, where even a lot of the people don't get served, I try to send a message and uh, set an example that you are only as good as your weakest, is what you do to help your weakest in society. Whether it's children, whether it's women who are, uh, aren't empowered in the, some of these villages where it's a male dominated society and they're not treated fairly, they don't have the same opportunities or rights, or animals that are often ignored. So I have a lot of strays living in my house and I always try to take care of them so they will appreciate you. I can guarantee you that. Um, so taking care of the animals is also a big part of my disaster response and I appreciate you listening to me and if you have any questions just let me know. Thank you. Yes? How do you get paid for it? So, so you know, a lot of people ask us about how to break into the field and what I heard from you is that sure. in 9-11 you just showed up and started yeah. working and to some extent it feels like you kind of say, hey, I'm going to go do it and I'm going to go make well, it happen. So I don't have this, uh, I don't have this ideology that uh, you know, people that own things and have a lot or want to buy a house or have nice stuff is a bad thing. I, I have nothing against that. Just for me personally, I'm very unmaterialistic. I own this laptop, a guitar, my Chevy Lumina that's breaking down half the time, as Colonel Saab can attest to, uh, it's a 96 Chevy Lumina, and a few books and clothes, and I just really don't care about having stuff. You know, I raised my son to be self-sufficient and do his own thing, what he wants, uh, I, I, I told him, look, I'm going to Pakistan. When I decided to stay in Pakistan, I said, this job doesn't pay a lot. So he was in high school at the time. I said, listen, uh, it might be just one of the best things I ever did for him, actually, was to tell him that he better do good in school and get a scholarship because dad doesn't have this nest egg or silver spoon to, to, to feed you with. So he got a scholarship. He, he went to St. Mary's College of Maryland, a very good academic school, and he was able to do that. And so I guess what I'm saying is that for me, I don't really need to get paid a lot, and in nine years working in Pakistan, I've only actually taken a salary salary for three of them. And that three uh, years of salary has mostly gone to some of the things that maybe my budget didn't fund, somebody I wanted to help, my music project, Sonic Peacemakers, where I put uh, the biggest singer in India and Pakistan, Atif Aslam, with Guns N' Roses, because I know those guys, so I put them together, and you can see what they did on YouTube together. So. The Music and Peace Project, I put some of my own money in that I got paid for. So 
When I do pay myself, it's usually to try to fund something like that. Um, I do, my NGO does pay for my travel. It does pay for the things I need. I don't really have to buy that much food because Pakistanis, I can tell you one thing about Pakistanis, they're so hospitable that they force you to eat. So I came to Pakistan at 200 pounds, and now I weigh 300 pounds. And I've been very happy about that. I mean, I, I, I love the food in Pakistan, and they love a white guy that loves their food. So, and the culture is that if you're a guest, then they have to feed you. And if you clean your plate, and it's completely, you completely eat everything, they, that, they think that means that you want a whole other plate of food. So you have to be careful. Yeah, Colonel Saab can attest to the fact. Yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll be fed, at the, you know, I'll go to the, this family will invite me, and it can be the line of control, the last village, the most poor people, and they'll kill their last chicken and demand I eat it. And they'll be, they'll be really hurt if I don't. So I have to, you know, I have to eat it. Or if I'm at some place in Karachi or wherever, wherever I'm invited, you know, they, they really want to feed you. So it's uh, kind of a double-edged sword, you know, it's, it's uh, I love the food and they love to feed me, but, you know, it's not that healthy to eat as much as I've been eating lately, but, you know, I've enjoyed every minute of it. So we'll see how, maybe I'll just keep expanding like the universe or something. But, um, because uh, I'm not going to be able to go on a diet there. I'll have to leave there and go on a desert island for a month and not eat anything to get away from it. If I stay in Pakistan, it's, it's impossible. The, the, the emotional blackmail they give you is unlike any I've ever experienced in anything. I mean... I grew up in the South. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, the, in the South, it's amazing hospitality here. And my Aunt Kay from, uh, from Waverly, Tennessee, uh, I, I mean, I stayed with her and I know wonderful Southern hospitality. but. Pakistanis carried a step further. They got their AK-47 sitting against them. Like, oh, you're going to have seconds, right? <laughs> no, it's not that bad. But, you know, they, they are hurt if you don't have food. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is what happened one day. And this happened several times. Okay, so have a big dinner, and you eat, and you clean your plate, and then the man of the house says, you haven't eaten anything, <laughs> right? So he fills your plate up again, and then you stuff yourself, and he's happy, he's satisfied that you've liked his food and all that, and then, then this 90-year-old grandmother comes out with a cake, and you're like, oh, I, I couldn't get another bite in. And they say, but, but, but Grandma baked this cake just for you, and because you're helping her people, and, and she hasn't baked a cake for any of us in 10 years, and she didn't bake the cake for you. So, I mean, how do you not have a piece of cake? How do you walk out of there and say no to that? So this is, this is my, uh, the cross I have to bear. But I'm enjoying every minute of it. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the salary thing is not a really a big deal for me. I don't care. Yes? Do you have any examples or stories about when language barrier really affected your work? Uh, no, because uh, I have learned my lesson very well in all these disasters where I go to foreign countries that the first thing you do is you find the local people in the ground, on the ground who is honest, who is the most brilliant, who needs a job, and then you hire them to work for you so that you now have, you, you attain their knowledge because in just a few days, they tell you the lay of the land, they interpret for you. So while you're learning a little bit of the local language, language, they can tell you and they can have conversations for you. And you kind of train that person on how to be an extension of you because being an interpreter is kind of an art. So you kind of have to show them, okay, I'm not asking you to be yourself talking to them. I'm asking you to take on my personality through you and whatever I have to say. So you need to understand what I say and you need to answer back to me. So you, you train people in, in to, to do this. So in every disaster, I have found those young men and women who are brilliant, who can interpret. And almost everywhere I've ever gone, I've found somebody that, that speaks English that I can take onto my team. Having local people on your team is an absolute must in disaster response if you want to be effective. Because you all of a sudden, You'll, you'll get their take on what's going on, what the people's thoughts are, what's important, what's not important, what the needs are, and then you can communicate instantly with everybody. Yes? Um, how big is your NGO? Like, what's the makeup of your staff? I have had up to 100 employ employees during the floods of 2010, uh, but right now we have about 75 employees. Uh, there is about, uh, right now, about 10 doctors. Uh, five nurses, uh, maybe 20 emergency medical technicians, uh, a few lab uh, and x-ray technicians, 
uh, about five pharmacists. Then we have a couple cooks and drivers and, and then logistics managers who I've trained uh, who've been with me since the earthquake. Um, and you know, it, when somebody gets a good job in Pakistan who's from a poor village, they tend to want to keep that job. So you can, you, you know, if you take care of them, they'll, they'll stick around for the most part. Although I do have about six employees that some of them are in, they, you know, because I tell my employees, listen, I can only pay you so much. I, it'll be fair, but it won't be as excessive. I'm not the UN. I can't pay <coughs> large salaries. And uh, so I pay good salaries, though. And I take care of them. And I'm very good if they have a wedding or a death in the family. You know, we have a whole system that uh, <coughs> HR that, that, that takes very good care of the, the needs of our employees. But I've had several that got an opportunity through working for my organization, getting experience, they got an opportunity somewhere else. So I have doctors that now work in the UK. I have a couple of my logistics people. One works in Saudi Arabia, one's in U uh, United Arab Emirates. So I, I have different people that have moved on. But uh, most of my core team is there of about 20 people. And then over the years, we've added uh, more. And this mission, we've had to add even more because we've, uh, we've now we have two really large missions, emergency missions, and then we have a mother child health center in SWAT, Northern SWAT, uh, which was another area three years back, four years back, that had a, uh, the, the <coughs> Pakistan Army had to go in and kick the crap out of the Taliban and get them out of there, and there was a lot of uh, people that were displaced, and they were also affected by the earthquake and the floods, so they had a triple whammy. So we're up there with a mother child health center that has you know ultrasound, x-ray lab, things that most rural health centers in Pakistan don't have any, there's, they just don't have them up there. They're very, very poorly staffed and poorly managed and they don't have a lot of medicines. So we're up there working out and then, so a lot of my team is there. That's our normal mission right now. And then, of course, we're in these emergency flood and emergency refugee missions now. So I'm like, so we're at capacity with our 75 people. So we've had to add a few more temporary employees and we take volunteers as well. Um, usually, volunteers from the States only come when it's, all over the news, you know, when, when there's something that's headline news. If it's not headline news, then uh, maybe I'll get a few here and there in the summer. But for the most part, people only come when it's the thing that everyone's talking about. So during the earthquake and the floods of 2010, we got a lot of volunteers. Other than that, people, for the most part, aren't willing to come to Pakistan. Even Pakistanis, America, Pakistani Americans who've grown up here, have some, their, their parents and their families have some trepidation and worry about them going back. But, I have found, being that I don't have a security budget and have run around uh, some of the most dangerous uh, areas of Pakistan without security for nine years, and I'm still alive. So I think there's something to be said for that, that yes, there's problems and I do take risks. And I've been trying to get myself killed for years, I mean, but it hasn't worked yet. Uh, the way I look at it is I should have been dead of a drug overdose when I was 16 <coughs> to 18 years old when I was doing massive amounts of cocaine and, and acid stuff. So I'm in bonus time. So if something happens to me tomorrow, I'm good. My son's grown, he's good, everybody's squared away. So, well, my fiance is from Pakistan, I don't think she'd be too happy about that. But I'm ready to go. I mean, so I'll go to these areas without fear. When you go to people, and when you communicate and deal with people without fear, there's a different reaction. If you come without guns, and you come with doctors and medicines, and you won't, or refuse to have guns around you or any security, well, then there's a whole different way of communicating. If you come with security because you're afraid, then even the local people who aren't Taliban or aren't Al Qaeda, they'll be, oh, well, why is he afraid? Why has he got so many guns? They don't, they're, they're simple people that live in villages. They don't understand when you come with a military helicopter, you know, stirring up all the dust and, and logos all over your stuff, and they think you're being exploited. You come with a bunch of guns, and they think, what's going on here? Is this guy CIA or something? Then it's a whole different way of, of them approaching you. So you approach them with love and medicines and no guns. And you go there, and you have local liaisons, and pretty soon these people say, Todd, we will never let anyone touch you. Guarantee you, on our honor, on our family's name, on our lives, we will not let anyone get you. So that's my security. Them and God. Yes? Uh, does your uh, response to a different disaster, like for communicating between different organizations, different, different disasters, like... Is uh, your communication or tsunami different than, say, during an earthquake? Yeah, it, it's, it's, every time is different, every day is different. It, when you're a disaster response lo logistics person, or anybody that does disaster response work, if you think you know it all, and if you think you're better than everybody, 
well, you're not going to do a very good job, even if you think you're doing a good job. You have to have the approach that every time is different. You're not. You're just a human being that's going to learn and be on a curve. Yes, you have some experience, but because every disaster is different and the logistical situation is different, the kind of damage is different, the, how the people were affected is different, the number of NGOs, the lay of the land, the geography, uh, the weather, all sorts of things are different in each case. I've gone to places where there's no communications, where satellite phone was the only thing. And then I've gone to other places where the signals worked. I mean, so you, you go there and you study the situation and you study everybody around you and you look at who the partners might be, you look at what you have that somebody else might need, and you look at the things that you might be lacking that somebody else might have so that you can work together and maybe trade off some things or help each other. So you have to communicate, coordinate, collaborate, and be compassionate. And if you do all those things and realize that, you, that nobody knows it all, including me, and that be willing to learn and be very much, if you're, if you're a person that does not adapt well and you have to have your routine, and you have to have your own bed, your own thing, and you go to a disaster zone thinking that somebody like me built a Marriott for them, well, then don't come, because you'll be nothing but a headache for me and everybody else. So, you know, just being adaptable is one of the most important things, and knowing that it's always different. It's always different, everywhere you go. Uh, in some ways it's the same, but it's always big differences. Yes? So I, I had a two-part question. I wanted to ask you how you felt um, your presence as a, as a, like as a man uh, affected your outreach to people. I know some of these regions, like you said, have, kind of have a stronger patriarchal um, control, and so I, I wanted to ask you about that. And then I also wanted to ask, for those who are interested in going into humanitarian disaster response, um, even though you're just kind of haphazard, what kind of uh, recommendations or directions do you think would be interesting or helpful to go in? Well, I, I think that as far as um, being a white guy working in Pakistan, uh, at, at, which this may be, uh, you know, counterintuitive to the thinking of Americans because of what they've been fed, which is basically 2% of the truth 100% of the time by our media. The other 98% has been ignored. So, you know, it's like if we reported all the rapes and robberies in New York and never reported anything good about New York, and just negative, negative, and only when somebody cut somebody's head off in New York or shot somebody in the face or killed a baby or ate a dog, you know, if that was the only thing that was ever talked about, then that's what we would all think about New York City. Well, that's what has been done to Pakistan. I don't know what the, the, the agenda of the media is to, for, for Pakistan to be uh, the world's whipping boy, but there's a lot of things going on in Pakistan that aren't all their fault. There's a lot of external forces as well as the internal problems. And there's also some pretty damn big mistakes that our own country made after the uh, Soviet-Afghan war. We left five million Afghan refugees in Pakistan and for their, their problem, while we went on to become the lone superpower. You know, so I don't, you know, don't get me started on that because I got a whole nother, uh, you know, presentation about that. I love my country, but I'm not going to let them off the hook. I don't sweep stuff under the rug. So in, in regards to uh, being a man, uh, in, in, in a white guy in Pakistan, they trust you. They trust you more than their own countrymen sometimes. There's this idea that, that you know, that they trust a white guy. There are even people think I'm a CIA, you know, there's some people, that, obviously you can't generalize. There are people that think I'm a bad guy or CIA or they wonder why I'm there. But for the most part in these villages, people have welcomed me with open arms, been very loving. I think it's partially the way that I approach my job. And of course, I don't allow in my own organization any discrimination. Uh, we do a lot to try to empower women. I'm working right now with uh, a lady named Maria B. She's a big, uh, one of the biggest designers in Pakistan of, of ladies wearing pur uh, purses and shoes and things. So we are going to be starting a, an empowerment project so that in these most poor villages, ladies will make shoes and make the embroidery, but they'll be making it and they'll be a partner and they'll be profit sharing and they'll get a stake in it and they'll make money and then some of the money will come to my NGO to help fund that. And we hope to make a, a big brand where ladies everywhere just have to have this thing. You know, they go shopping and they, they have to have that thing because they know it's helping women in a poor village economically empower themselves. And women in Pakistan who have a gig that economically empowers them, it changes the whole dynamic of the family. It changes the way they're looked at in society. It changes their rights and things. So a lot of things come from being economically empowered. So just as a human being, I just know that wherever I go, I try to respect everyone from, from, the, from the 
person who's the least to the, to the highest person. And at the same time, the highest person disrespects me, then I will throw it right back at them as, as, as well. I mean, I had a tussle with the Prime Minister's uh, nephew because I bought some solar lights from him, and he didn't deliver them, and he didn't get, get back to me for a month. He, I saw he was active on Facebook. I was trying to send him messages, text, phone, email. He wouldn't answer any of them. So I went on Facebook and I put it out there, you know, to everyone that this son of a, uh, you know what, has done this and, and I'm not going to put up with it because it's donor money and I don't care who he is. So then everybody got on my side and started pressurizing him and finally I got my lights and, and so, you know, it doesn't matter to me uh, who you are. Uh, in Pakistan, this power structure, uh, you have to respect it, but if somebody steps out of line with me and in between me and my donor money, then I, because I'm, I can either, I love being, I would really rather be a teddy bear, but I can turn into a grizzly bear if they want me to, very quickly, and I do, and as Colonel Saab knows, I have. And, and, and just to add on, you know, uh, when people are in need, especially in the disaster prone areas, or affected areas, and there is some guy, you know, whoever he is, when he comes with the with the open heart and he wants to help in the real sense, so the people, you know, they have this much a sense that they, they understand that this gentleman is really, you know, there to help them out. So that's why, you know, Todd has such a good effect on people and he has built their trust and then you trust him. Yeah. Yeah, I think you were next to I just want to know how you go from wanting to help to actually starting an NGO and what that process is like. Well, I, I think that what I've learned is that and I do believe in God, and I believe that, uh, and without trying to, you know, uh, you know, I'm not going to preach anything. I'm just going to say that I believe that when I decide to take action and do something, that God opens doors for me. So you start doing it, and you learn everything that you can about trying to do it, and then, at least in my case, doors start opening. People start coming forward. Things start happening that help me do what I am doing. Uh, so it's happened that way. And sometimes it's been a little freaky, a little eerie, the way that it's happened sometimes. But I think that overall, um, if you want to start your own organization, it's a little different than if you want to join, obviously, another organization, a larger organization. Um, I, I guess I would recommend, and, and I even did it in, in my case, working as a volunteer with other organizations. At some point, when I got to Pakistan, I realized that I, I it just kind of dawned on me that I was ready to start my own thing and not just be a volunteer of somebody else's organization. So at that point when I felt like I really could do it, I just learned everything I could. I got some lawyers in Pakistan to figure out how to register. And uh, you know, it won't be easy, because nothing in Pakistan is easy when it comes to that kind of thing. But you know, you figure out how to do it, you get people that know how to help you legally register things. And in my case, we registered under the Societies Act as a nonprofit social welfare act. And, this, and the, the Societies Act goes all the way back. That law has, was put in place when British rule was in India. So it's a, it's a law that has been uh, there ever since then about governing uh, uh, social welfare societies. So it's very much English common law uh, in, in, in the way that it was written, and, and therefore very much like registering American NGOs as well. It's very different in some other countries, believe it or not. But in, in Pakistan, it's very similar to the way you would register an organization similarly a non-profit in, in, uh, in Pakistan, and uh, I mean uh, in, in UK or US. So, uh, you know, you basically, uh, you, should, you should definitely, you know, work with some other organizations for a while and do some missions with them, uh, because once you take on the responsibility of having your own organization, then everything, the buck stops with you on everything. The finances, the way that donors look at you, you have to have your audits in a row, you know, I've got all my audits posted on my website. I've been audited by UNICEF, I've been, uh, that has given me money, I've been audited by Direct Relief International, uh, 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 the IDRF in Canada, International Development Relief Foundation of Canada, UK Medical Aid in Pakistan, and one of our partners in the US Global Giving, who supported us for some years. And all of them are very tough with the with the records and the so you have to have that part of it. Uh, Greg Mortensen was a guy who got in a lot of trouble because he didn't have that side of things managed properly. Um, so always make sure that your registration and your documentation and your financials are, if somebody questions you, you have to be able to say, okay, you know, do whatever you want. I dare people. I just open dare. Find corruption. Here's all my audits. Get a forensic accountant from Deloitte and Touche and, and, and find it. I dare you. Um, that's the way it is. Yes? 
Um, so first, just wanted to say thank you to both of you. I think this has been a really interesting two hours and so neat and fun to hear people that are actually doing things on the ground. Um, I think we hear a lot about theory, um, a lot, but to, to hear the practical piece of it has been great. Well, I hope that someday I have time to actually have a class here because I guarantee you that I would benefit from it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't work for Georgia Tech, but I do work for an NGO that's based here in Atlanta called CARE. Um, there's three of us actually from here, and we do a lot of emergency work, and we're working in all the provinces in Pakistan. Um, but I just, someone had asked a question, and I just wanted to um, throw out a couple of resources that have helped me along the way, because I came from the private sector and moved from private sector into sort of the state the world social sector in the space. And um, so there's been a lot of learning that I've gone through. Um, and there's some excellent associations out there that are just so rich with resources. Supply chain logistics is not, it is becoming more and more of a profession within, within the sector and there's more focus on professionalizing it. Um, but the International Association for Public Health Logisticians, IAPHL.org, is got a lot of great um, resources, the most active form I've ever been on. There's also the Humanitarian Logistics Association. Um, they've got a lot of great things. And then also um, People That Deliver. If you just Google People That Deliver, um, those are three really excellent, um, you know, just associations. They're all free to join. Um, and you can learn a lot there too. You know, and hear stories from the field and connect with you know, various people um, that, that are actually doing the work. So anyway, I just wanted to offer that because I know you had asked about, um, you know, some resources and, you know, as much as you can learn, uh, you know, on your own, on your own time too. I, I mean, that shows initiative and I think that's what a lot of, a lot of what, you know, humanitarian response takes is initiative from people that, you know, are curious and hungry and want to help and do good. Um, but you know, learning some of the foundations too. So sure, and a, a small, a small organization like mine, who's basically a team of disaster response specialists and healthcare specialists that have gotten together, that are really a really good field implementing team. So a really good field implementing team does not mean you're a good NGO or a good charity or a good organization. We had to grow into that and learn how to do it through trial and error, making mistakes. And one of the things that we did that has been most successful for us is in the early days, and even now we piggyback on larger operations. We'll take, we'll partner with an organization like CARE who's larger and has a bigger budget and more people and working in more areas and we can implement, be an implementing partner in a certain area where we have experience if they need that. That's why Imran Khan Foundation ha has us for these two disaster response missions. That's why UNICEF has used us and a couple other organizations that are more funding agencies in UK and, and, and US that have supported us because we're an implementing field working agency. So there is the, the implementing agencies, then there's the donor agencies, and then there is the mid-level and large international NGOs uh, in, in between that do both things. They, they raise funds, they, they fund small organizations, they do field work and manage it themselves as well. So there's different levels of organizations. Then there's your community-based organizations within Pakistan at the village level or the provincial or district level that work at some level and some of them are now associated in a larger national, uh, uh, basically a national network of rural support programs that have gotten together and that together they kind of become a, a, a larger agency and they coordinate and collaborate together. Uh, so there's all sizes and all levels of agencies and I think they're all important. I think without the large ones we're in trouble and without the small ones we're in trouble and without the middle, mid, medium size they, they all have a role to play and everybody's important and, and what I learned in disaster it works best when everybody's kind of collaborating, communicating, coordinating and the little ones should not be uh, you know thinking that the big ones are just you know uh, messing everything up and the big ones should not think that the little ones are too small who are they everybody should respect each other and work together and when I see that happening in a good way it, it, it works out best for the people that we're all trying to help Thank you. Thank you.